right, thank you. I don't know if your prayers were very powerful, but you all smelled good. <laughs> I don't know what you're wearing, but it's like, wow, this is a good smelling group of people right here. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. We are in a series called Reset. Uh, how many of you need a reset in your life? <laughs> you need a reset, man. Life, life comes at warp speed. I mean, it comes really, really fast. And so we're delving in to the whole subject of finding peace in the age of anxiety. Now, I can tell you as somebody who's been to 23 countries uh, and, you know, been alive 63 years. Is that how old, I, how old am I? 63 years. Uh, <laughs> been to a lot of places, and I'll just tell you this. The world isn't getting more peaceful. It's getting more stressed out. It doesn't matter the country. I don't care how beautiful and palatial it might be or how beachy it might be. I just tell you what, there is stress everywhere I go. And it's almost like, you know, choose your crisis. You know, you look around the world and you've got poverty in a lot of places in the world. You've got crime. You've got terrorism. You've got this little thing called coronavirus, you know, going around, which, you know, people have gotten more than, more than a few uh, comments about you're absolutely crazy. Why would you be, you know, going to you know places where this epidemic? And it's like, well, it's simple because I feel like I have the grace to go, and uh, you know, and there's I there's no fear. I have no fear. You know, I have a little mask and essential oils, my Bible and prayer, and all of you praying. Yes. There you go, all of you praying. So you know, I'm, there's nothing to really be afraid of. You know. Um, so everywhere you look, you know, you see terrorism, you see, you know, just all this crazy. What's important is that when you look biblically is that God has never taken su- surprise by surprise by a crisis. Jesus is never. In fact, Jesus is almost always confounded by the responses of people in crisis. You know, I mean, he'll, you know, all hell will be breaking loose. A storm and the boat's capsized, like whatever. And people will be freaking out. And Jesus will be like, you know, what, I mean, really, what, what are you stressed out about? You know, he's almost perplexed. And it's like, well, we are human. <laughs> but he doesn't cut any slack for that because there's a higher level that he wants us to, to rise to. And, it, and it's a place where stress doesn't own us. Anxiety doesn't own us. Fear doesn't own us. The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our mind through Christ Jesus. And we will let the peace of God rule and reign in our hearts. Why? Because he's the Prince of Peace. That's why it's really important to to develop the discipline of celebrating wins. We talk about it a lot. You know, you hear Pastor Brandon talk about wins. Every staff meeting that we have, every meeting of any leadership, we always start with... What are the wins? And everybody goes around. And what that does is it disciplines you to look for the activity of God in the previous week. Because I will tell you this, God is active and alive right now. And I don't care how bad your last week was, thank God it's a new week, but no matter how bad it was last week, he was at work even though you didn't see it, even though you didn't perceive it. So the discipline is we've got to stop and slow down and cease and desist to observe what's going on. Now, I want to show you, I, I want to tell you a great story. I'm going to show you a great picture. And we could almost go home after this. We could almost like, oh, man, that's all I need right there. So we got these people coming to, coming to Pakistan with us. The one lady from the church that I pastored up in Washington is actually the lady that introduced me to the main guy in Pakistan. And she's never been. Uh, but she, she supports financially and prayerfully. Um, she has spoke to their churches over the Internet, and she's a wonderful lady. Her and her husband actually helped us start our church up in Washington all along, 28 years ago, okay, so a long time ago. And it's still going. It's still thriving. And so, you know, I, I talked to her about, hey, why don't you come? You know, I've got Pastor Friends, and I've got Gunner, i got Preston and me, and her, I'd love to, I'd love to, I'd love to. And so she applied for her visa, and the average time it takes for the Pakistan consulate to issue a visa was three days. Everybody got theirs in three days. You know, the two times that I have um, uh, applied, I got mine in three days. One day was like five days because I make mistakes on applications, always. Um, so, but, but that's kind of the rule of thumb. Well, hers had been sitting in the queue for 10 days. Well, we're supposed to leave like tomorrow, and she hadn't got it Friday. Now... So we've been in contact, we've been praying, having a lot of people pray, and she said, well, here's the deal, man. They stopped processing. The website says they stopped processing visas 
at 12.45 p.m. the afternoon Friday. It's done. It's over. So she says, I'll have an answer by 1 o'clock. I said, okay, awesome. We pray. I don't hear anything from her. And so I, t- I have a class with some interns, t- uh, three of them that I've never really met before. Two of them I know, but I sat down and introduced myself to them. And here's the picture of these awesome young ladies uh, that are interns here at the Rock of Roseville. And, and I sat down and I said, hi, I'm Bob. I'm going to be teaching. And, but before we do, I want to ask you, how many of you have faith? And, you know, when you ask that question, if you're a Christian, there's an automatic response of, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I said, no, I, I, mean, I mean, really, how many of you, like, right now, in this moment, have faith for something really big that needs to happen? And they said, yeah. I said, okay, we're all in. And I told them the story about this girl, this lady, Crystal, and now we're past the due time. It's over. There's this sense of it's over, she's not getting it. Oh, well, God must have other plans. But then there was still this, you know what? It was 3 o'clock when we started this class. So 12.45 and long past. It's Friday. Um, I said, let's pray. So we all just launched into prayer. Boom. Told the story. Started teaching. At 3.05, all of a sudden, my phone lights up, and it's Crystal. Wow. So I just hit the speaker. She goes, you're not going to believe it. I said, yes, I am, because I got five awesome young ladies here, and we just prayed our brains out. And she goes, I had two Mohammeds call me from the consulate. (laughs) And they said, you know, sorry we're so late, but we just passed your visa. It'll be coming shortly. And so she literally just got her visa Friday afternoon at 3.05. And we'll be picking her up in Seattle on the way to Dubai, then Lahore. So... That's pretty stinking exciting, if you ask me. And, but once again, there, there's always a point where you and I can just resign ourselves and give up and quit and kind of go, well, you know, it wasn't God's will. And then there's that other thing where the Holy Spirit is saying, you know what? Yeah, the time's passed, but the time's not passed for me working in this situation. And it doesn't really matter when, when an agency closes or what their website says, you know, go for it. Swing for the fence, believers in Christ. So I want to give you another angle as we talk about reset. I want to talk about something that, well, first I want want to say two things. One, I love this message, and two, I really don't like this message. (laughs) I love this message because this message is full of life and is going to give you all kinds of life. What I don't like about it is because it's got so much conviction towards me because I haven't really mastered what I'm getting ready to tell you. Should you really be telling us anything? <laughs> well, I don't know. Stay tuned. Genesis chapter 2. Let's see. Let's, let's go through this. How are we doing on time? And we're going to have communion. Amen. Communion. Amen. This is going to be good. Genesis 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, what do we say the seventh day? God finished the work he had done. He rested on the seventh day, from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy. He hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done on creation. Now, what's interesting here is in the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, he he blesses everything that he creates. You know the story. God spoke this into his existence, spoke this into existence. He stood back, and he blessed it. He affirmed it. He approved it. And that was the plants and the animals and the sea and the sky and uh, creation and plants and vegetation and everything. And, and he blessed it. But it's interesting that he doesn't call any of those holy. They're blessed, but now you get to a day that he not only blesses, but he calls holy or complete or fully whole, or set apart. So this day is holy. Now, here's where we're not going to go. We're not going to go, well, should we keep the Sabbath day? Which the Sabbath day is from what time to what time? Friday night at sunset to Saturday night at sunset. And, and I will tell you that we are not going to talk about the law or the legalism of the Sabbath because Christ is the end of the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. No man can be justified by the law. If you're in Christ, you are justified by faith, not by the law. So what we are going to talk about is the principle of Sabbath. We're going to talk about the principle of Sabbath. And what does Sabbath mean? It comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. It means to stop and delight and to cease from work. This is God's example. So how many of you think it's a good idea to follow God's example? 
It's a good idea. Exodus 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, keep it set apart. What's he saying? He says, remember, call to mind, remind yourself that this is a holy thing. This is a sacred thing. This is a set apart thing. This is a dedicated thing. Now, I do want to just say this. If you know somebody, if you know people that um, dutifully keep the Sabbath, don't judge them. Don't judge them. You don't need to judge them. If somebody has a conviction, say, well, I just think that the Sabbath, listen, the Sabbath is still what the Jewish Sabbath is. It's Friday night, sundown, to Saturday night, sundown. That is the Sabbath. And if you know somebody that keeps it, don't judge it, okay? But we're free because Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. He, he, not the day, he is our Sabbath. Now, I want to tell you one quick funny story. I had a friend, and they were observers of the seventh day. They were the seventh day. They were Sabbatarians, okay? And they used to, they used to pound me. You need, you need to keep the Sabbath. You know, it's here in Exodus. It's here you know, in Genesis. It's here and it, and on and on and on. It's in the second giving of the, uh, of the commandments in Deuteronomy. It's all, and, you, and you have to do this. And I said, you know, I'm free from the law. You know, Christ has made me free, completely free. And so we, and it's, Christ is the end of the law. And the Bible even says this one. You know, the Bible says that no man can keep the law. Okay, so it's futile to even try. There's only, there's only two ways you and I can become saved if you will, and that's by 100% obedience and adherence to the law, which Jesus said nobody could do, or faith in Jesus Christ. So he says, you can be justified by keeping every jot and tittle of the law, but no man can. Game over. Game over. So we would have debates, and they were friendly deb debates, and I would hang out with them on Sabbath, you know, and man, they would have the clock set, and on Friday night, you know, if it was like 623, 623, boom, the TV went off, Everybody stopped, and the Sabbath has started, and then they would eat, and, you know, eat a lot, actually. Um, they would feast, uh, and it was kind of fun, and then they'd, we'd debate some more, and debate some more, and debate some more. Well, one night, one night, I'm in an Albertson's grocery store at 9.30 at night, Friday night. Now, when's the Sabbath? Friday night, sundown. Okay. So, I'm getting some ice cream. And I'm walking to the ice cream aisle, and, and all of a sudden, I see something kind of pop up and down out of this peripheral, you know? It's like, what, what was that? You know, it was like a little pop-up. And so I just, I, I just kept walking, and I kind of saw it again. It was this little head popped up and down. And I just thought, that's just weird. What, what, what is that, man? So I walk over, and I look over this, this shelf, this display, and there's my friend hiding from me. Yeah. I said, hey, John, beat red. He was 5'10", he was 220, I mean, he was a thick guy. He was there for ice cream, too. But the problem was, it was the Sabbath. And I, I had a lack of grace in those days. I said, hey, John, what are you doing? I said, but you're not shopping on the Sabbath, are you? I said, that's my point. I rest my case, John, right now. And he was just beat red. He was a tough guy, but he was beat red. You know why? He was dead to rights. I said, that's my point. You can't keep the law. Let me tell you something else. Jesus isn't hacked off because you're getting ice cream on Friday night at 9.30 at Albertson's. See, that's how it can get ridiculous. Sabbath was made to be life-giving to us, not life-taking. It was meant to be life-giving. So the principle, we want this principle that God worked, he stopped, he rested, he blessed, and God was present. Okay? God took care of the business that needed to be taken care of in six days. You and I would do good to ask ourselves, what's the business I'm supposed to be taking care of in six days? And if I can get it done, great. And if I can't, then I can. Reset after that. God took care of the business he needed to take care of in six days, the creation. And on the seventh day, he took care of the business of rest. 
He paid as much attention to his rest on the one day that he did in the creation on the six days. So that's who we're trying to emulate. Not a guy hiding in Albertsons because he's buying ice cream on the wrong day. So here's the big, big question. Why is it so hard for you to stop? <laughs> Thank you for those holy murmurs. Uh, if, if, the, if we talk about the Sabbath, we're talking about reset, we're talking about stopping and ceasing and desisting. Everything I read, all the studies and articles that I read, shows that everybody is just going faster and faster and faster and breaking down at just an incredible rate. So my assumption is that a lot of people in this room find it very difficult to actually put the brakes on, stop and cease and shut everything down. Would I be a correct in that assumption that there's a lot of you that find, a lot of us that find, how many of you find it hard to just stop, shut it all off and do nothing? Can I say my hand? Okay, great. Support group starts on Monday. Perfect. <laughs> It's hard. I mean, here's a little time thing. Show, th show this little time thing. The reason it's so hard to stop is because we're so preoccupied with different things. I mean, this is how you and I are going to spend our lives a year and eight months doing housework, a um, year and 11 months socializing, two years, two months shopping, three years, seven months eating and drinking, and six years and eight months social media. We're going to spend six years like this, growing a hump on our neck. <laughs> Six years watching people's pictures of food, watching pictures of their little kids running around playing their first soccer game, you know, or some little meme. Six years. And we say, I don't have time. We have time. We don't know how to stop. We don't know how to slow down. We don't know how to cease. My name's Bob, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> the energy drink industry is $50 billion. That's a lot of dough. $50 billion to what? Speed up. Coffee, globally, is the second most sought-after commodity, and it comes in at $100 billion. It ain't all because it tastes good. It's because we go faster, jump higher, think quicker, feel more energized, right? That's a lot of money for things that just help us go faster. But we always have to ask, when we go faster, what price do we pay? I mean, you're looking at a guy that I, I loved speed. I, I did, not the drug. Cars. I love speed. I had 10 tickets. 10 tickets. Speeding tickets. That doesn't even count the warnings I got, but I had 10. Let me just tell you, it felt good. Going 100 plus in a 69 GTO, felt good. Sitting in jail for five hours, not so good. No. Paying lots of money for tickets, not so good. Losing my license for a couple of months, riding a stinking bus, not good, not worth it, not worth it. You know the worst part about my jail experience? <laughs> I go to a jail, they take me to a jail, it's a brand new jail. I'm the only one in the jail. There's nobody in the jail. So I go to this place, I'm thinking, wow, it looks clean. <laughs> I walk in and there's a room it's about half as big as here. This is the big opening, the big jail, with this kind of carpet, and nobody in there. I'm a people person. <laughs> that was hell. That was jail hell. I'm in there. It's like, there's nobody in here. I would have liked a few thugs to talk with, at least, you know? But it costs you. Speed costs you. Restlessness. Evidence by, see if you can relate to any of these, busyness. Busyness has been called the narcotic of the soul. It's become a status symbol, a hiding tool to avoid intimacy. See, if I'm busy, I don't have to engage with you. You know, in the old days, guys that didn't know how to be intimate with their wives had these things called garages and shops 
And, and that's what they would do. They would go be busy because they're fixing a fence, or they're fixing this, or they're building this, or they're changing the oil on the lawnmower, and they never had to face their wife. So we, we use busyness, you know, to just kind of hide for a Hey, can you come over for community group? Oh, nah, busy. Translation, man, I don't want to sit with a bunch of people in close proximity, and somebody might ask me a question. Yeah, busy. so we use busyness as a tool. And, you know, the deal is we attach significance and importance to it. I can remember feeding off this. People say, Pastor Bob, I know you're busy. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> I am busy. That means important, too, because if you're busy, you've got to be important. So you just feel kind of good about that. And then all of a sudden, you start realizing that everybody comes and says, I know you're busy, but they still suck the time and life out of you. You end up resenting. <laughs> True story, not current. This is old news, but I'm telling you, there was coming a time where you're just going, ah, you feel important, and then all of a sudden you're going, man, my soul is sick. It's empty. It's bankrupt. I'm running on leftovers. Give me another Red Bull. Relentless, busy, hurry. How many of you are in a hurry? <laughs> Do you run like in a hurry? Hurry sickness. I mentioned it last time I spoke. Won't be redundant on it. But when you hurry, you have no time to think, reflect, enjoy. Hurry. Noise. Noise. That's why it's hard to stop. Noise. Cars. Let me pull up my barber chair. That just scares me. <laughs> Man, I just feel like I'm just going to... All right. <laughs> Does it look as precarious as it feels? All right. You won't laugh at me if I fell, would you? <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> thanks for your, thanks for your, you're not at me. Oh, thank you. Oh, that was a great lie. Um, noise, advertising, begging you, pay attention. You, have you experienced the deal where you talk to somebody about, about you know something you're thinking about buying, the next thing there's a pop-up for, for an Amazon ad or something. It's like, ah, Siri is in your head, man. It's in your computer. I mean, it's a noise. Have you noticed how noisy cars are at stop signs and stoplights? <laughs> you know, I mean, noise. Everywhere we go, there's noise. Well, if God's speaking in a still, small voice, and we're surrounded by noise, at some point, either God has to speak louder or we have to still our soul. Noise is awkward. I mean, silence is awkward, I mean. I signed up for a silent retreat one time. Had no clue. Had no idea what I was getting into. Look spiritual, get a workbook, pictured, hey, going to journal on some tree stump out in the middle of the woods. Awesome, sounds good. Didn't know I was with you know, a bunch of introverts that it was really easy for them to not talk. <laughs> and I'm there like, What do you think of the silent retreat? <laughs> the soul so jammed up, so noisy, man. It was the most awkward. It was terrible. No, it was there was jail by myself. There was silent retreat with a bunch of people that just found it very easy to just point at something. I mean, it's like. And in my head, I'm thinking, you know, wow, man, just don't offend anybody. Just, this is ridiculous. I'm out. I'm out. I'm not a hermit. You're hermits, you know. No. It's hard. But you know what it was? It's the restlessness in the soul. It's the noise in the head. You don't want to slow down. You know why people don't want to slow down and be still? Because there's voices. <laughs> not if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know. Voices of the past. Voices of regret. Voices of pain, voices of disappointment, voices of failure, voices of comparison. And you still all the noise, you start hearing those little voices. You're not good enough. People don't like you. You're going to jail again. <laughs> right? You know what else restlessness is evidenced by? Relational skimming. I mean, how many of you would agree that this book tells us to be deep with people, connected with people, 
feel pain with people. Listen to people. Minister to people. Be ministered by people. I mean, but we live in this time right now where we skim through relationships. We do drive-bys, drive-through. How you doing? Think about how many people. Watch this phenomenon when you're out and about. How many people actually talk at a restaurant versus are on their phone the whole time and glance up once in a while, like Sean talked about. Just glance. Yeah, I'm here. You're here. Okay, good. We're good. So this is all the stuff that's going on. Worry. You know, worry is owned by the what ifs. That's why we don't want, you know, what if? You know, you slow down long enough. And I'm telling you that if you and I slow down long enough, the voices will come. I love what Henry Nouwen said. The voices will come in solitude. The voices will come. But eventually the voices will go. And when the voices go, and part of how the voices go is the one voice wants to crowd them out. But if you never get to the point where you still yourself and develop that discipline of listening to him, those voices own you. And I would say that's a big reason people don't progress in the faith. Because all his words are good. They're true. They're life-giving. They're redemptive. They're restorative. It's all good. The voice of the accuser is all about taking you out, taking you down, nullifying you. You got nothing to say. His voice wins. So let me, just, let, me, let me just move on. I just want to just share two, two things. Um, gosh, don't have time to go. But the, there was that one Seventh-day Adventist study that was pretty interesting. They, they, they did a longevity study on Seventh-day Adventists, people that do keep the Sabbath. And you know what they found out? The, the average Adventist lifespan was an average of 10 years longer than the average non-practicing Sabbath person. Once again, even if it's done out of legalism, there's something about taking that day, they live longer. That's, that's, that, isn't that incredible? And what they figured out is that the average person that practiced the Sabbath, that one day a week, those 10 years added up to a lifetime of one-day Sabbaths. It's a good thing. But how you do it is, you know, that's, that's the big way in. You know, the uh, prescription drug industry... Okay, we picked on energy drinks, we picked on um, coffee, you know, 50 million, 100 billion. The prescription drug industry in America is $400 billion. So would that tell you that we're getting healthier and healthier or sicker and sicker? I think we're getting sicker and sicker. You know, and I, I don't think a lot, uh, none of it's God's will. I think when we mi- mismanage our lives, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and everything, there's consequences that catch up eventually in us. So restfulness is evidenced by margin, breathing room, slowness, quiet, deeper relationships, trust, and peace. Now, here's two blessings to the idea, the principle of Sabbath and stopping, okay? This is why you want to do this. Okay, number one, when we stop, we make space to see what God is doing, okay? Overload causes spiritual blindness, If you and I are so distracted by other things, we can't really see the thing that God is doing or wants to be, to take place. Now, I don't have time to go through this, but I'm just going to give you an observation from my favorite stories uh, in the gospel, and that's the the loaves and the fishes, the multitudes that were hungry that Jesus had been, you know, teaching. The disciples said, hey, it's getting late. Send them away. You know the story. Great story. But this is what's interesting. Just as I meditate on these, on these stories in, in Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, John 6. Here's the sequence. Before these miracles, Jesus has worked. Okay, He's prayed. He's ministered. He's, he's doing what Jesus does. Okay, He's blessing people. He's doing good to everyone. Uh, and then there's a rest period where he goes off by himself. In fact, the book uh, in the Gospel of Luke, there's uh, nine specific times where it says that Jesus intentionally just gets away from everybody and, and, and gets alone with his father. So that's what he's done, and then he slows down, and he rests, and then he comes, and then you have this familiar scenario where thousands of people are hungry, and he's been teaching. It's hot. They want to get them away, and here's what Jesus does. It says that Jesus makes the people sit down. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm starving, if I'm hungry, if I've been someplace all day and haven't eaten anything, 
I don't care if I eat standing up. I don't care if I eat running down the road. I don't care if I sit. I just want to eat, you know, right? But why does it say specifically in all four of these accounts that Jesus makes the people sit down? Because he wants them to experience peace first. He wants them to, to, to experience order first in the midst of, you know, all this chaos going on. The disciples send them away and people were hungry and all this stuff. I mean, Jesus, he's creating order in potential chaos, which is what he does so beautifully. He makes the people sit down. Three out of the four, two out of the four, three out of the four, it says this. He makes them sit down in the grass. Why would it specify the grass? I mean, just sit down, eat, awesome, miracle, out. No, he makes them sit down in the grass. Jesus is given a message of what he would tell in John 10, I'm the good shepherd. That's awesome. What does the good shepherd do? Well, Psalm 23, verse 1 and 2, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He, he is beyond the miracle. He's teaching something about himself as a shepherd. That's an odd, I mean, that to me is just an incredible description. In the grass, and in that sitting down, in the grass, it says he restores our soul. Don't want to go into anything about emotional eating, but if you're, if you're stirred up and you're hungry, how many of you know you eat a good meal, a good salad or avocado toast, wherever you young people eat? Uh, how many of you know you feel a little better emotionally, right? Jesus is all over it. He's got this. So when we stop, when we stop, we make space to see what he's doing. He's basically, basically he, he doesn't care about just feeding people. He wants them to participate in what he's doing, and he wants them to watch what he's doing and how he's doing it. And maybe the next time they're starving, instead of just freaking out, maybe somebody says, hey, you know what? Let's sit in the grass. Let's reflect on Psalm 23. Maybe that's what takes place. So the second thing is, and then we have uh, communion, so would ushers come on forward and just begin to distribute the communion elements? When we stop... We make space to reflect and see what God has done. So we stop to see what he's doing because he's always at work. And then we stop to reflect on what he's done. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say, I just don't hear God. I don't see God working. I hear other. I would suggest to you that once you develop the discipline of paying attention, now that's coming from an ADD guy, okay? <laughs> Listen, dude, I was on medication. I get the whole deal. Off the charts in the ADD spectrum, okay? There's no debate, but I can tell you, ADD or not, you have no excuse for abandoning what God wants to do. And if he wants you to sit down, chain yourself to a chair, Bob, and sit down. And I wish I could tell you that it was easy. I wish I could tell you that it, happened, you know, that it, it was you know, just first attempt to work. I'll tell you, it's taken a long time. But I'll tell you what, I worked hard this week. I worked on a lot of things, getting ready for Pakistan, a lot of visa issues, a lot of this, that, this message. And I can tell you, I worked hard. You know what I'm going to do later today? I'm going to rest. I'm going to sit down with the most beautiful woman in the world. And I'm going to have a vegetarian omelet <laughs> with a side of bacon, maybe. Um, <laughs> And I'm not going to glance at her. I'm going to gaze at her. And I'm going to ask corny little questions like, are you going to miss me? <laughs> Can't wait to FaceTime. That's what I'm going to do. Because I do it every time. And then I'm going to get on a flying fuselage. <laughs> and for 20 hours, I'm going to be sitting on my rear. And you know what it's going to be for me? The Sabbath. Because I got 365 videos downloaded, teaching, worship, and I'm going to sit there, man, and I'm going to put my little coronavirus mask on, my little essential oil under there to distract me, and I'm going to 
pray and I'm going to meditate and I'm going to worship and I'm going to doze off for a second. I'm going to twitch myself back into reality and it's going to be, and 19, 20 hours is going to be easy. You know why? Because it's going to be with God. So my wife and I, one of the disciplines that actually has worked really well for me in the last five years is every two to three months I get away for two nights and three days by myself. And there's no TV, there's, no, there's nothing, man. Usually no, no social media at all. Uh, there's reading and there's writing and there's um, sitting and there's staring into God's creation. And I tell you, when you calm your soul, man, God reveals himself. So LaDonna and I got away for two nights um, last after church Sunday, uh, went up to Tahoe, had two days of doing nothing and just walking and breakfast and lunch, and it was awesome. And then we started, uh, we got ready to leave, and she had brought communion elements, and I said, okay, let's take communion right now. And so we opened the, the blinds, the op- opened the, the curtains. We were all packed, and we just had two chairs. And I said, let's just sit here for a few minutes. Because I used to be the type of guy that when it's over, it's over. Let's get out of here. Let's go home. Got to be in a hurry. No, sat there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> but this was really interesting. We sat there and just looked, holding the elements, just like we got right here. And the first thing I saw was big rock. And it hits me that our life is built on the rock of Jesus. And Matthew 7 started speaking. And then we looked at the water. There's Tahoe. Wow. Little rivers of living water. Life-giving. Then looked at the mountains. Wow, this is God creation. Genesis. He created all this told us to steward it. Just began to think about that. Then looked at the snow. Then captivated by Isaiah 1. Come let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. And so we're just sitting there holding the elements, looking at the snow. And that went on just for a little while. And then how God created everything. And then the verses that God, Jesus said, I behold, I'm making all things new. And I'm thinking, he's still creating. Did you know that? He's still creating. And so we just rested in that. We see law in that. So Pastor Mark, I want you to come and just close this out.